The Art of Flow. Flow. Welcome to The Art of Flow, a podcast that explores connecting with your body, mind, and soul via movement arts and creative exploration. Through conversations with movement artists, circus performers, flow artists, and fire dancers. My name is Morgan Dalgano, and I'm the creator and host of the podcast, a floor arts enthusiast and a life coach. Feel free to check out some of my other work with individuals looking to get unstuck and discover peace and energy at ignitevibrancy.com. And occasionally, I will bring coaching concepts into the artistic dialogues. The Art of Flow is a free public resource for creators, teachers, and supporters of the arts who are interested in flow arts and fire dancing. It is available for mainstream distribution on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, Google Play, YouTube, Stitcher, and at theartofflowpodcast.com. If you believe in a show that provides inspiration for artists and conversations on the creative process, please support the podcast on Patreon to keep it going. As a supporter, you can earn early access full-length interviews, submit questions for interviewees, be mentioned in an episode, and get a behind-the-scenes look at how the podcast is made. That's the Art of Flow if you're searching for it online. You can also follow the podcast on Instagram and Facebook to receive shorter clips of episodes, updates, and notifications when new episodes are released. Today, we're talking with Dr. Kate Regal Van West, a scientist, artist, and entrepreneur with a passion for play and well-being. She founded SpinPoint. Kate completed her PhD in the health benefits of poi at the University of Auckland, where she conducted the first study to scientifically investigate the effects of poi on physical and cognitive function. Cool. And she was awarded the Future Leader Award from the Royal Society of New Zealand and the Best Doctoral Thesis Award for her work in the poi health field. So Spin Poi is a social enterprise that helps people grow through poi. It supports individuals and organizations across the globe with evidence-based programs, that specialize in improving quality of life for seniors and has been featured across international media, including the BBC World News, ABC News, TV New Zealand One News, and Maori Television. So for more information, visit www.spinpoi.com or connect with Dr. Kate Regal Van West on social media. There's links in the show notes below. Tell us about your first experience with flow arts and poi. What stands out in your memory about the experience? I was at circus practice um, in the US. I grew up doing circus stuff and someone in the circus knew how to do poi. And, um, you know, eventually I just asked him if I could try it because I was doing more like flipping and flying and like more intense things, but um, it did kind of pique my curiosity. So eventually I, um, I just gave it a spin and the feeling of it was just amazing. Like I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know how to do any tricks or anything. I was just spinning it in a circle. And I just really loved the way that it felt. And I continued to be kind of like mesmerized by that feeling. Like the more in my practice, I became totally addicted to it. You got hooked by the experience of like the physical feel and the somatics of it. Exactly, yeah. That's really cool. And how did you said circus stuff? Can you tell us a little bit more? Yeah. So I grew up in a town called Normal, Illinois, of all places. (laughs) I'm from a place called Normal, and in Normal, I was in the circus. Uh, (laughs) The the town has a circus history. Um, Traveling circuses used to come through in the winters and set up in the barns because it's a farming town. Um, And so, someone. at the university, there was a gymnastics program and it kind of slowly started morphing uh, to include more circus arts and it became a kind of fully fledged collegiate circus. And someone from that circus started a youth circus at the elementary school that I went to. So for most people, it was just like an after school thing that they did. And for me, I was like, I'm going to be in Cirque du Soleil. Like, this is my life. This is everything. Um, I don't know, it's just really special for, I mean, yeah, circus is so powerful. And for someone like me, I was quite shy, um, had a hard time fitting in. I was really like athletic, but I didn't like to compete. I didn't like competitive sports. So circus was really a home for me and a safe space and somewhere that I could uh, be myself and 
express myself and just get absorbed in the flow. It's wonderful you're exposed to that at such a young age and you got to grow with it as your interest and your passions shifted even within this niche. Because you studied at the University of Auckland, but as you're saying, you grew up in normal Illinois. So how did you get from, you know, being in the circus and discovering poi there to New Zealand? Yeah, I was really, really lucky to just be in the proximity of this youth circus program, um, which is great that it's, it's more and more common now. Circus programs are popping up everywhere. Um, and then, yeah, I started to discover other aspects um, of I started to discover other interests of mine through the circus. So like, for example, you could um, design the programs or the t-shirts, you could compose the music for an act, you could do the choreography, there was all these kind of other things to think about. And I was simultaneously studying arts technology. So I was working with art, like working with technology to make art, basically. So like installations, video projections, etc. Um, so my worlds were kind of like melding. <laughs> At a point, and I decided I wanted to go on and do my master's degree in interdisciplinary art and media. So I, I did that in Chicago, and I kept doing circus stuff like all along the way, um, playing music, performing, and then I did this project with Poi where I wanted to look. I was really interested in the kind of as an artist, like the geometric patterns that Poi was creating and sacred geometry, and I was starting to incorporate that into my installations and I was like man what if I what if I did this project that sort of illuminated the geometry of poi and I incorporated that into my master's degree so that was the first time that kind of academia in poi and circus um like really met in terms of doing a, a, a project like an art project and that just like opened my mind because I, I thought they were going to be like these separate paths and I was like actually I think they can all be one thing. So then I had the idea based on that um, project, which was a video project where I was just like um, showing the trails of the poi, which I had to do by hand because this was like 10 million years ago before like all these amazing apps, and like all the technology. Um, I mean, I was like most using motion tracking. Um, so then I went on to do the my um, final thesis project. I promise I'm getting to New Zealand, which was the Orbitar, which was a digital Poi musical instrument. So I embedded accelerometers and gyroscopes inside of Poi, and that was sending data to a computer about where it was in space, and that was generating audio and blah blah. And I wanted to go on and do a PhD um, in a similar path, and I was having trouble finding places that would accept me, <laughs> um, figuring out where to go. And also along the same um, lines, I was trying to bring Poi to places because I understood the therapeutic benefits just from my personal experience, but also I had started teaching people. I had a storefront space in Chicago. People were coming to me for Poi lessons and there's just one health benefit after the other. So I was trying to bring Poi into places like rehab centers and um, assisted living facilities, but it was kind of just like who are you, what is this thing, and where is the research to substantiate, you know, that this actually is good for your health. So all of this culminated in the idea that, okay, if I could strip back this crazy musical instrument that I'm creating, and if I can just prove that spinning a weight on a chord is good for your health, if I can scientifically prove that with rigorous research, then I think I can open the door for poi as a therapeutic tool, I could then go back and incorporate the stuff with sound and light and music that I'm doing with the Orbitar. And I could just uh, open a lot of doors and get a lot of people into the flow arts. And that is when, sorry, I feel like I've been talking for like two hours. That is when I reached out to the University of Auckland in New Zealand because um, Poi originates with the Maori people of New Zealand, the indigenous people here. And I thought if I was going to do a study on the health benefits, um, I really wanted to be in New Zealand just to incorporate um, Mataranga Māori, Māori knowledge and um, way of thinking and way of doing things into my research. So I sent the University of Auckland an email. I can't even remember who I reached out to at first. I, you know, it's like, what department do you reach out to? Like, I want to study poi and health. Um, so I found someone who passed me on to someone who passed me on to someone. And yeah, a couple months later, I landed in Aotearoa. I landed in New Zealand. I started teaching in the dance department the next day and I embarked upon my PhD between the Center for Brain Research and Dance Studies on the effects of poi on physical and cognitive function. I love your story so much because there's a couple different threads. I mean, one thing there's this that really stands out is that you had these separate parts of your life, as we often do. 
And instead of just seeing where they could converge or where they could overlap and then kind of like keeping them in their boxes, you allowed them to come together and to cross the same way we kind of do when we're spinning props and you mean like cross pollinate ideas from one prop to another, just using the shared concept. And the other is that you weren't afraid to like reach out when you realize like this PhD program is your goal. This is the way forward. You th really thought about like, how can you do it ethically? going straight to where the Maori people are, straight to where you can connect with the roots of Poi and its history, as well as conducting the research, bringing it forward into like more the modern day age. Yeah, just to touch on that point, I do think it is it is hard sometimes when passions in your life seem disparate um, to like draw those connections. And also when something's never been done before, you, it's like just not on your mind. So it is a challenge. And also I just like painted quite a rosy picture, but of course there was like, tons of problems along the way and, and pushback and, and all this stuff. According to your doctoral research, how can poi benefit the mind and body? What did you find? I studied um, healthy older adults in particular. I was interested if poi could be used as a tool to improve quality of life as we age. So I was working with older people who um, 65 up, who were maybe was 60 up actually, I think it ended up dropping it down so I can include a few more folks. Um, but these were people who were living in the community. Um, so they weren't living like in a aged care facility or assisted living facility. And yeah, they did poi. They'd never done poi before. They did poi twice a week for an entire month. And I measured all sorts of things across three domains, physical, cognitive, and social, emotional. And the statistically significant results were that poi improved grip strength. So the strength in your hands, which is um, really important, especially as we age is actually a good indicator of overall health and mortality. So the stronger grip strength you have is associated with actually living longer and having better health. It improved balance. So these people were standing up. We, we could have, you know, done poise sitting down or not moved our lower body, but I was specifically balance is a huge thing for older people. So I was, we were pivoting, we were doing half turns, we were shifting around. Um, so poi improved balance, which is really exciting. And it makes sense when you think about the uh, crossing the midline and all that. And the third significant result was it improved sustained attention. So the ability to uh, sustain your attention over time. And that was quite an exciting result to see because it was a cognitive uh, change and it was a relatively short intervention period. Um, it makes sense with something like poi because it's so active. You're controlling this object orbiting around you. Like anyone that's done it knows that it is engaging your mind, <laughs> but to be able to show that with science is really exciting. So those are what the kind of that's what the science said. And I was also asking people questions all along the way because I think getting people's thoughts, like science is very important. And my main goal was to open doors for poi in more of a clinical setting, but um, people's feelings are also important too. So um, some other themes came out just, you know, like people were having fun, which should not be underrated, especially if we're talking about a therapeutic intervention. If something's fun, then you want to do that thing, which is like really important. Uh, and also play has profound health benefits, of course. And people found it relaxing. And they also, um, one thing that came out as a theme was they really enjoyed the challenge of learning a new skill. And flow arts is quite cool like that. The learning curve um, is really good, right? Like you can get some stuff right away, but then there's just like infinite stuff to learn. Um, so yeah, people noticed that and they, they enjoyed that challenge. Interesting. So like they like the constant feedback and be able to like achieve new goals. And they were saying that like it was very fun and engaging. So it was something that would positively reinforce them coming back to the activity on their own without someone being like, hey, you're in the study. You got to do your poi two, two times this week. Get on it. Yeah, exactly. Like there's, you know, there's a reason why there's things that we all know that we should do that we don't do <laughs> because we don't want to. So uh, yeah, it's actually really important, like wanting to do something. And then that also like um, has an impact on how, how engaged you are with the activity has an impact on the benefits that you're getting. Because if you're only sort of engaged with something, um, you're not creating those neural pathways. You're not, you're not as focused on, on the thing. So it's actually quite important in terms of the benefits you're getting that you are um, really engaged and enjoying it. So now that you had these really substantial quantitative and some qualitative results. How have you been able to legitimize these results in other fields? Like you're talking about bringing it into elderly care facilities or hospital settings or other mental health spheres in a way that people who are not familiar with the art firm are able to access. Yeah, exactly. That was a big, a big goal of mine. So 
as I was finishing my PhD, I went into some um, elderly care facilities. I just went in for free and I was like, uh, I've got this thing. I've got, you know, this, this clinical study, but that was done, you know, in academia in this controlled environment. So like how, I want to know how this might work in the real world. So I was working with people um, living there across all levels of care from independently living to um, hospital and dementia and also working with the staff because I needed to understand, you know, what their world was like and if they were going to be incorporating a new tool like POI, um, what would they need, you know, in, in order to be able to do that successfully. So those kind of, um, pilot. And I was also collecting a little data, nothing as rigorous as my PhD, but I love a little, a little data. So uh, those kind of exploratory studies um, helped me understand what kind of resources I would need to create to be able to promote this further. And I um, also started working with the Auckland City Hospital and doing some pilot kind of um, studies on POI in their rehab ward. So mainly people were coming from stroke, but also other neurological conditions. And so, yeah, based on that stuff, I started putting out some resources. Um, so I didn't, <laughs> I didn't like ever like intend to run a business. It kind of happened organically like this, um, put out some resource, say, Hey, if you want to work with poi and older adults, like um, here's a PDF guide about that. And then just started expanding those resources from there and slowly, um, doing more small studies, like including like Parkinson's, working with kids and expanding the resources and the training that I was uh, providing. So I've kind of gone from there. Um, I spend a lot of time doing like facilitator training. So working with people who are not flow artists. Um, and in New Zealand, everyone knows what poi is because it's like part of the fabric of culture and life here, but they might have never done poi. Um, or even people who have done a lot of poi, it's quite different to think of it in the health and well-being rehab framework right it's going to be really different than the types of movements you might be doing for your like personal practice um yeah so basically i just gotta keep expanding the resources people keep coming to me and i just keep uh training people and creating um things that people can use to start their own poi programs in whatever kind of setting they're in that's so exciting so i i'm hearing that organically as you conducted more research, you put more information out there and the more information out there meant people are reaching out to you to say, hey, how can I use what you have discovered about POI or discovery being like quantitatively proven about POI to help this specific population that I work with or that I'm a part of and look at it through this very specific lens that maybe, you know, maybe if you're elderly, you learn a little bit differently about POI than if you're in, have Alzheimer's right? Because you have different identity factors there. And so by talking with the caregivers and those involved within the programs that these individuals who are learning the skill of POI within, like whether it be a hospital setting or a care facility, you can know how it will best integrate with their day-to-day -day living. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Every population is a little different. Like, of course, the fundamentals, it's, it's poi. So there's only yeah. <laughs> so many like different kinds of things you can do with it. But you would actually be amazed. That's something that I have learned. It's like the more that I know, I feel like the less that like the more you can break it down. I think that's true of of anything. But yeah, it is a little bit different with different um, populations and that PhD. So I also like um, published an article in a peer reviewed journal and did all the necessary things. So I think that that was the um, and, and becoming a, a doctor was like part of it, not because I need, I wanted to be a doctor, like I'm the exact same person that I was before that happened. But also when you approach people and you say, I'm doctor, blah, blah, is, you know, there's like a certain level of legitimacy there. So those things- People um, perk up, that. they pay a little bit more attention to what you have to say. They're like, oh, you really, you've studied this intensely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So yeah, that, that opened all those doors. Um, and allowed me to work with, you know, all these different, different populations, which I'm continuing to do and explore. So for the PhD program, for your research, what challenges did you face during the studies or leading up to the studies and how did you overcome them? Oh man, it was pretty <laughs> challenging. <laughs> I think in any PhD is probably pretty challenging. Um, so I was not um, supported or funded like to do I think a lot of times people assume like once you're inside academia like you just have the resources that you need which is probably true of some um, people's situations but for me it was not so I had to self-fund the whole thing it was quite expensive um, just from paying 
um, staff, like I, I needed staff because um, it was a double blind randomized controlled trial. So the people teaching the lessons could not be the people administering the tests. So there's all these um, factors, even like the battery of cognitive tests that I used on the computer. I think each time someone took it, it was like $7 or something. And people took it four times and I had like hundreds of participants. So it was just like, it was expensive. So I did like a crowdfunding campaign. Um, and went into debt and worked a lot of jobs at the same time and finding participants was kind of challenging like I don't know how people think that happens but I was like making flyers and like putting them in mailboxes and like going to like the yacht club and like <laughs> you know the library and like trying to figure out where to advertise this thing so just getting it up and running I think doing the actual study was the like conceptually, it was challenging to understand how to do a rigorous sound clinical trial, but like that's all information that you can find on the internet and just and, and like learn. So it was like all of the other things where it was like there was no protocol. It was like, oh, how how do I actually um, make this happen? And then also poi, as I mentioned in New Zealand, has a specific connotation. And so I think that was a little bit challenging and I was less, I had less understanding um, when I first started of the kind of language that would be more appropriate, or I was a little bit less um, sensitive, you know, to how to how to approach it. So when people think poi, they think Maori poi here, they think of kapahaka, which is Maori performing arts, it's mainly women, you're going to be singing um, and doing steps along with your poi as as a big unified group. And you know, what I was going to be doing in the study with poi was really different from that. And so I think it was challenging to communicate that. And a lot of people um, saw the study, especially men who are in general, just less about preventative um, like measures for their health anyway. It's more like, oh, I have a problem now, I'll try to fix it. Just in general, not everybody. Um, so yeah, I had a hard time recruiting people a little bit because I think it was hard to explain what it was. And then also, of course, I'm not Maori. So um, that is a continual, um, challenge that I have being being in New Zealand as a as an outsider doing this kind of research on a Maori panga or a treasure. That makes sense. Yeah, there's different connotations that you had to either to recognize and also educate on the differences between the style of poi you're using within your studies and the traditional poi and then overcoming these um, some of them like they're not even stereotypes because they're just cultural conceptions from history, but in some ways boxing people in within like, I can do this or I can't do this, which is challenging for getting participants in a study. Yeah. Totally. So what do you, what did you learn about the history of Poi from the Maori? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, I, um, just a precursor that like, I obviously I'm, I'm still just coming with my outside mm -hmm. perspective. So I will never, um, understand things in the way that Maori will understand them but um just my experience poi oh it's to it's it's like totally different here like poi is a storyteller of the culture and so every movement that you would do with a poi is to to tell that story and that's the that's the motivation for why you might be doing that movement whereas outside of New Zealand, like um, circus poi or whatever, flow poi, it's like um, the goal is usually to like learn cool moves and to like push that progression maybe to perform, but it's like you're pushing um, the limits of what you can do with your poi, where is it, that's not a, not, it's not about pushing the limits in that way. It's about how can we um, work with the poi to represent a narrative or something. So I think often when people outside of New Zealand who do poi, when they see Kabahaka, the performing arts, like, oh man, the poi moves are so simple. Like they're just doing the butterfly. Like, <laughs> you know, this, this is not about that. It's like about something totally, totally different. Um, and just the history of poi, yeah, as a as a messenger and a symbol of Maori culture throughout time is, is amazing. There's not a lot of early written records because it was passed down um, just through oral tradition. So the first kind of written records are from travelers you know, like white dudes who came over and were just like, here's what I see. So but like, that is what it is. That's an observation. Um, so there's not a lot like written about that. And in fact, there's really nothing written down about the common, the common like sentence that you hear over and over again is poi were used by originally by Maori men to train strength and dexterity for battle. And there's no written record of that, which is not to say that that's not valid. 
um, like that could very much be the case. So, but it's just hard to, yeah, it's hard to trace back. Um, and there's no word here like poi spinner because poi is just part of the fabric of life. So it's like, you're not a poi spinner. You just, you just do poi, like you, like you do anything else. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's really beautiful. And then of course the actual movements are like really different. If you're using short poi, um, it's more they're, you know, bouncing off of your arm, they're percussive. It's like a, it's a totally different thing. That's so interesting. I wonder what stories the poi tell or what narratives are woven throughout Maori history and culture and which were the ones that have like uh, been passed down and what are like the new ones that have been woven in in more recent times. Yeah, there's I've, definitely some um, like famous waiata, uh, famous songs, poi songs um, that are still sung. And then, of course, people, yeah, these kapahaka performances, people are addressing the issues of, of their time. So that, that could be a tribute to a particular person or, you know, something that's going on in the world. Of course, it's all in te reo Māori, the native Māori language. So it's often hard to um, find trans translations of these things. But every now and then you can. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about challenges. We've talked a little bit about your foray and exploration into the history of poi and recognizing the, the differences between the work that you do with poi and that of its traditional roots. But what about the surprises? What did you find in your research that you didn't expect? I think in terms of the actual like scientific results, I had a pretty open mind like I understood from the start that it was like science and I had no influence yeah. over that or I should not have any influence over that so I was like well whatever it says it says I was really hoping there would be some benefit but I was like there so might not be um <laughs> I think I was surprised at the I kind of like mentioned this a little bit earlier about how the more that I know I feel like the less that I know in a way um looking back on the way I taught those lessons during the clinical trial which was one of my first times working with older people um I think I didn't realize like the the depth and the breadth of what you can do with poi and the way that it can be used. Um, I was teaching in a in the way that I knew, which was like I had been teaching people how to do tricks. So I was like, okay, we're gonna learn. I, I mean, I had it. I had a plan, and it needed to be repeated. So it wasn't it wasn't random. But the way I was thinking about it was totally different. And now, working with all these different populations from people who can barely lift a finger, um, you know, trying to think about can poi be used in this way? And it can, <laughs> there's, there's so much you can do with it and it doesn't have to be spinning in a circle. You know, there's, there's like all these different types of things you can do with it. So that continues to surprise me. <laughs> um, and also I guess just the path that it's led me on, I guess, I, I don't know, I hadn't imagined exactly what I would be doing, but the excitement around it and the possibilities seem to be limitless. Every new thing that I try, it's like, oh yeah, that could work. Like, oh, I'll try with preschool. I'll try it with this. It's like, oh yeah, that could be like my life's work if I wanted it to be. So yeah, if anyone out there is interested in working with poi in any kind of like any of these contexts, there's a whole more than a lifetime worth of work that you could do. Honestly, as I was looking through your research and findings, I was thinking like, oh, wow, I work with middle school students right now and um, in as a behavioral aid. So I thought back to a time where I've like worked with students with autism and like introduced poi to them and was thinking about the benefits for like right and left brain thinking and trying new things and flexibility and like just opening up conversations for like how we learn. Cause a lot of poi is like being able to be aware of how you learn and how you feel when you learn something new and how you feel when you're frustrated and overcoming those challenges and with a lot of feedback. Yeah, exactly. That's it's amazing to have this physical thing like or, orbiting around you. Like talk about feedback. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's an it's an amazing tool. As are many other flow arts and circus arts. So, what advice would you give to folks who are interested in going into clinical research, and specifically in the flow arts? Yeah, um, I would say first make sure you're really passionate about doing that because <laughs> it, it will be challenging. So you don't want to lose your luster partway through you want to be full of passion and and zest um draw upon what's already out there like if you don't have to reinvent the wheel don't reinvent it so that's you know part of what i've been trying to do is lay a groundwork and lay a foundation so it's not quite so hard for 
um, people to get started. So look at the research that's out there from me, but also on in related, there's a lot of research on juggling, for example, and um, related things. So try to make it easy, easy on yourself. Um, and also see like if you can find someone, if you're doing this in academia, like your advisor or even just someone else, like maybe me, or I don't, I don't know who, someone else who has done similar things or is doing similar things because it can be lonely, especially if you're um, forging a new path. And so to be able just to have the support of someone who has been there and done that or done something similar to be able to talk through things, I think it really helps keep you sane. <laughs> okay, so a mentor and also draw on what's already out there. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, maintain and sustain your passion. Yeah, Three. I mean, if, really you, if you end up <laughs> if you end up not being passionate about it, that's fine too. Then you know maybe move on. Or if you're trying to finish your degree, maybe finish your degree and then move on. <laughs> that's also that's also fine. But you just want to make sure you're yeah you know, before you go into it, you're feeling really committed and passionate. So you mentioned that this was your first time during your research working with elderly communities within, uh, like within a different setting and a different population than who you taught poi to before. Can you share with us one or two standout memories of how Poi and Flow was received either within your research or since, since you've continued working with these communities? Yeah, there's something kind of amazing I see with, with Poi and, and seniors. Often when I go into like an uh, assisted living facility or um, an elderly community, there's always people that are saying, seeing it and being like, no, that's not for me. I don't wanna try that, you know? But then <laughs> you just, get the poi out, um, maybe in a circle. It's a good good way to be, you can see everyone around. And people just can't help but try it. It's really contagious and it, it is, the poi is really leveling. So everyone is in the same boat together, right? And, and it's new and it's funny. You can't help but laugh. You're hitting yourself in the face. You get tangled with your neighbor, hopefully not too much because you should have appropriate space in between you. Um, but you know, it's, it's like, it just creates this joy around, no matter what you're doing with the poi, it just creates this joy around it. And I see that time and time again in people who often don't participate in activities, which is quite a big deal, um, especially in um, certain settings, like for example, a secure dementia unit, for example, um, you know, they're participating and they're engaging, which is amazing. And also, um, oh, it's just nice to see that the play coming out, like so many um, older people that I've worked with have been so, playful, willing to make mistakes. I had this one lady who was inventing all of these moves. The poi kept getting like tangled, be like tangled like around her arm or her neck, whatever. She just kept naming them all like, oh, this is the bracelet. And like, this is the neck scarf. And she's just coming up with all these things. So it's just like really like I aspire to be, you know, to be like a lot of these people someday. So it's fun to see poi, um, you know, bring, bring that out in people. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing with us. I love that. This is the bracelet, the <laughs> necklace. Uh, just really getting to see people's personalities and their essence as they drop into trying something new and being willing to like join the group as a collective. The result, there's been a program going for a year now at one of the hospitals here and a POI program. And it's the most um, popular accessible program on the ward. So there, there is, like I'm telling these kind of random anecdotes, but there's also you know, these, pro these pro programs out there that are, are proving all these things. So it's really, it's really exciting. What do you find helps these programs last or sustains them? I think it's actually really important who's running it. Um, I've seen that time and time again. I've had failures um, going, well, not failures, but I guess going into facilities and doing training and giving the tools and then the program just never gets off the ground. So it actually has a lot to do with who is running the program. Um, yeah, and then also just making sure they're supported. So I guess that's where I, where I try to come in and make sure they have all the resources that they need um, to keep it going, to feel confident as a facilitator. I think there's a lack of training. A lot of people in a lot of positions are overworked. Um, they don't have a lot of time to try new things, to incorporate something new. And they've gotten very little training, which means they're not confident in facilitating the thing. So it's important just to make sure that whoever is teaching it does feel uh, confident because then that will, 
people will feel that and know that. And, you know, if you feel confident in doing it, then you're more likely to do it. And then oh, it's more likely that people will like it. And then it's more likely that it will sustain. So yeah, just proper training and resources and um, yeah, the, just who the people are, you know, some people are not great at <laughs> facilitating things. It's something you can learn, but some people are just, um, or they don't have the, the passion or the drive to keep it going, which is fine. That makes sense for in order for it to be accessible, it needs to be introduced like all the way through and people need to be facilitating or conducting, offering it as a service. Yeah. 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 So what's a typical day in your life look like currently? <laughs> oh man, there is no typical day. I'll tell you that. So Spinpoy is, I'm the only full-time employee at the moment. So I have certified instructors and I have um, people that I sometimes hire here and there to do something small, but it's basically just me. So that's hectic. I am customer support. I am social media, graphic designer, web designer, you know, creating the resources, facilitating the session. So days are like pretty hectic. Some days I might be out facilitating a service. More often than not, I'm sitting right here, (laughs) staring at my computer screen, uh, oscillating between, yeah, conceptualizing new things and also just, you know, running a business is like a whole separate thing to doing research or being a flow artist. So there's like all the things that go along with that. But I also spend a lot of time um, making time for people and I designate a certain number of hours per week to take calls um, from anyone that might be needing support. Um, Maybe they're wanting to start something out or they, in their community, or maybe they're just like stuck on a point mover. They just want to chat or whatever. I think that's one of the most valuable things you can do is give your time um, to support other people. So I have quite a few hours set aside for that too. So I don't know, no typical day. It's all over the shop. <laughs> gotcha. So if you're interested in incorporating poi into what you do and you're looking for help or your advice, like it sounds like Dr. Kate has some time on her calendar set aside for you. So please if this interview gets you thinking, coming up with ideas, like don't hesitate to reach out. We're all a community. Yeah, definitely. I'm going through quite a big change at the moment. I'm about to move back to the United States in the September. It's uh, June at the moment. So that's a big life That's a big shift. transition. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Been in New Zealand for six years. Um, so my focus currently is I, I want to hit the ground running as I do always. So um, I'm working with a lot of um, individuals and organizations already in the U.S. to do some uh, spin poise certification courses and uh, training courses and et cetera, support, support people that are there. And even though I've been in New Zealand, you know, I'm from the U.S. and I still have a lot of people from the U.S. reaching out. So I feel like I'm running two businesses at the moment. <laughs> I'm doing a lot of stuff in New Zealand because I'm about to leave. So it's like, you know, any last things are wrapping up. And then I'm also getting going in the U.S. in I'm focused a lot on kids at the moment. So during the first COVID lockdown, I was thinking about how my services could be of the most use because I was often going into these places, right? Like hospitals and assisted living, like wasn't happening. And I just thought, gosh, a lot of people are stuck at home, um, especially parents with kids. So what if I could create some original songs, poi songs and follow along uh, routine videos? And I ended up getting a grant from Creative New Zealand to do that with an amazing team of New Zealand artists. And that sort of set me on this path of making resources for kids, specifically preschool age. That's where I'm at right now. So I'm I'm making some curriculum. So I I have a bunch out there already, but I'm kind of uh, diving further into these curriculum based resources and working on my next uh, certification, which will be for educators to work with POI in in that setting. So kids and that certification, moving to the US, getting myself situated, uh, that's kind of what I'm spending my time on. And the Poi musical instrument is, is there. It's like a dream. It's a dream for me. I'll just see how I settle in the U.S. And uh, That's so exciting. I love that the certification for, you know, for folks in the U.S. is going to be hopefully available and that you're bringing Poi into the education realm even further and inviting it for even younger spinners to be exposed. Yeah, I think it's a really natural fit. Um, <laughs> I was just thinking this the other day. It was like, why is this just dawned on me? <laughs> when you think about like poi and, and older adults, it's not like the most natural fit. Like someone working with seniors might be like, ooh, you know, I don't know about that. It looks a little bit 
scary. It looks a little bit dangerous. Like when, but if you think about like someone who teaches preschool kids, if they just saw poi for like two seconds, they'd be like, oh yeah, that totally get it. <laughs> like maybe, maybe I picked the wrong, I had my reasons for working with older adults, but um, yeah, I'm excited. And I think that will open up um, a lot of new possibilities and, and markets. What brought you into being interested in the combination of sound and poi? As an uh, idea? So I, yeah, I'm also a musician and music mm -hmm. is a huge passion of mine. I think that's part of the, what drew me to poi because it's innately rhythmic. And, you know, when you're spinning fire, you, you hear it. And I just thought like, wouldn't it be amazing like to be able to create other sounds? It's just natural. I am not the, I'm like so many people have thought of this, right? It's like, it's like an obvious connection. It's just that no one had actually um, like made much like people have now there's a few things out there um, yeah I just thought with this thing that is already creating these rhythms um, even just experimenting between the two hands and like the different the different rhythms that that you could make it just seemed obvious <laughs> I can hear how that connects to your current project of with the animation that's happening so that you're making like poi songs you're really using the audio aspect along with the teaching and a way yeah. that it will cement for the younger learners. Yeah, and that's something amazing about Maori poi is the percussive aspect. With a short poi, the poi are actually bouncing off of your body. And so they're creating all of these amazing rhythms and stuff. So I think the idea of um, that is, you know, that's been happening basically since the beginning, the beginning of poi. Um, it's just in circus poi, the poi are basically silent unless you're spinning fire. So I think, yeah, just exploring those audio options is so, it's so exciting bring it back in yeah <laughs> in your opinion what can we do or perhaps are you currently doing to support diversity equity and inclusion in our communities yeah I think this is really important I mean whenever I can I just try to lift up the people around me who I think um can and should have more of a spotlight I try to give back so I volunteer for the movement voter project um, which is a U.S. organization that helps um, support grassroots organizations and communities to get the vote out in contentious states and to get, um, you know, the right people into into politics. So I just think like beyond even poi or what, what you might be doing for your passion project or your work or whatever, there's so many ways that each of us can give back. I often get overwhelmed thinking about all of these huge issues, <laughs> just like systemic racism and like all of these like problems <laughs> and I think oh my god like I'm not doing enough what can I do how do I change the world like then I always just drop back to think about um how can I best use you know the skills that I have and the position that I'm in to to make the most change that I can which just might be small change at the level of your community which is really important and valuable and a bunch of people making small change can make make big change um so I think just being a thoughtful sensitive uh, human, <laughs> lifting up the people around you and amplifying, um, amplifying their voices and practicing, practicing what you preach, you know. Definitely. Thank you so much for sharing. Those are really cool projects to get plugged into. And it can definitely be overwhelming thinking about all there is to the world. But it's clear that in the time of thinking about that, that you devoted your um, energy into areas where you can really make ripples. Yeah. And what are your perhaps lesser known passions or hobbies, the things you do when you're not changing the world, running a business, running around, teaching poi? I have so many passions. People always think like poi is my life, which I guess it is in some ways, but um, I actually don't even practice poi really anymore. I mean, I do poi like basically every day for some business related reason, but I love playing music. I cannot live without playing music. So um, when I moved to New Zealand, I actually moved here with a sousaphone, which is like a giant tuba that like wraps around you. I had like all my underwear and socks, like stuff inside of it. So I, I um, helped start like a street brass band when I moved here. But currently I'm just playing with a duo. We have a series of little shows coming up in the basement, which I'm so excited about. It's going to be really fun. And I also love drawing. I love skateboarding. I love doing acrobatics. I love climbing trees. I love reading. Oh, man. I love all the other flow arts, you know, like juggling, also Tai Chi. I practice Tai Chi. There's just so many things. I'm hoping like cooking becomes one of those things. I don't love cooking. And I think if I loved cooking, that would be awesome because I would be a little bit healthier with what I'm putting in my body, but not yet. Maybe someday. <laughs> Cross our fingers. Just, yeah. just keep coming back to it. <laughs> 
So what is your ideal world? Like if I could live any life or like the world at large, the like, world at large. <laughs> ah! <laughs> um, right. I mean, I think, yeah, that's a, a pretty tough question. Um, I mean, it's obviously not possible, but a world in which was um, equitable and fair and just and, and everyone felt happy and could do the things that made them happy, which would mean they would need their basic needs met, you know, at a minimum. Um, but I think people that have, often people that have their basic needs met are consumed uh, with maybe the wrong things and they've lost that spark to play, to do what makes them happy, to even know what their passions are. So I, it would be nice if people could get back to almost that childlike wonder and just enjoy, you know, I don't know what the purpose of life is. I have no idea why we're even here. So I just feel like if you're not enjoying the moment, which is, you know, easier said than done. And some people aren't in a great position to do that. But if you are in a position to enjoy the moment, to take stock of why maybe you aren't where you are um, and try to pursue, pursue that for yourself and give back to others just to try to make the world a more fair and beautiful and loving place. Thank you so much for sharing. I hear in your answer, a desire for equity and also for presence. Mm. Yeah, I, I try to strike a balance between thinking about the future and enjoying where I'm at right now, wherever that is. Is there anything else that you wanna share with listeners? Thank you. Thank you for listening, for being here. My website is spinpoy.com and it's got tons of stuff on it. In the show notes below. Look at the show notes below. (laughs) Yeah, it's all listed there. So don't hesitate to reach out. I'm here for you. Do you want to keep the conversation going? Join the Art of Flow Facebook group to be part of a community discussing episodes, sharing art, resources, and questions with each other. Thank you for listening and see you next time.